Take a second to think about how much your life depends on the internet. In that second that just elapsed, over 9.7 terabytes of data were exchanged around the world. This is nearly 3 million emails, 9,000 tweets, and over 80,000 YouTube videos. Today, more than 4 billion people around the world use the internet. In the next three years, nearly two thirds of the global population will be online. To build more inclusive, open, stable, free and prosperous societies of tomorrow, we need to close the gap between people who shape the future of the internet today. My name is uh, Gustav Lindstrom. I'm the director of the EUISS, the EU Institute for Security Studies. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's international conference, Closing the Gap, uh, which will be covering cyber, digital, and technological issues. And of course, we'll be running for five days. So a quite long uh, conference. And uh, one of the key things, of course, when uh, you think about the name Closing the Gap, is of course that we will be aiming to look at different dimensions of the cyber, digital and technological domains and how those gaps can be closed. So everything from international law, accountability, gender and so forth. And um, another thing which I think is very critical to say as a way of welcome is to indicate that we will be connecting a lot of different uh, sectors in this discussions. We have representatives from the private sector, civil society sector, also many academics. So really trying to not just close a gap here, but we're trying to continue to bridge uh, some gaps. As you know, this would have been a conference that would have been held in the beautiful Egmont Palace in Brussels. But unfortunately, as is the case for many other events nowadays, we uh, go virtual, we go online, uh, but just as you can see, we had uh, 250 uh, individuals registered. And of course, there will be uh, people coming in and out over the next five days uh, to join the event. But looking forward to some very uh, interesting discussions. Um, hopefully, you had a chance to look through the agenda to see the different topics that will be covered. And of course, I want to take an opportunity to thank all the partners on behalf of EU CyberDirect who have been collaborating to make this event possible. As you can imagine, to make an online event, although the distance question is not there and some of the logistics are not there, uh, indeed, there's still many other issues that need to be uh, taken care of. So a big thank you to all the partners. You can see them uh, on the uh, agenda as well. And of course, as you could see in the video, it is very important also to acknowledge the funding received from the European Union via the partnership instrument. So um, I just wanted to uh, lay the ground really for the discussions. And then also, as you have seen in the program, we will have the opportunity for some uh, keynote uh, interventions. And um, it will be my pleasure uh, in a few moments to pass the floor to uh, Commissioner Maria Gabriel. We're very happy uh, that she can join us from her busy schedule. As you know, she is the Commissioner for Innovation, uh, Research and Education and also previously was the Commissioner for Digital Economy and Society. So really very well placed uh, to be able to uh, give some commentary on this issue of cyber, digital and technology and the different gaps uh, that we have there that we're still working on uh, to, to bridge those gaps. We will also have an opportunity to hear from the Foreign Minister of Belgium uh, coming in uh, right after uh, Commissioner Gabriel. And then hopefully we'll have a few moments left for some housekeeping before we go to the first session. So without any further ado, it would be my pleasure now to pass on the floor to Commissioner Gabriel. Please, the floor is yours. We look forward to your intervention, madam. Thank you very much, um, dear Minister Goffin, dear Mr. Lindstrom, dear speakers and participants, good morning. Thank you very much for your invitation to join you for this debate. So I would like to start by saying that recent, recent months have made it crystal clear how much cyber issues, digital policies and 
overall multidisciplinary aspects of technology are critical in our lives. Cyber threats have become a matter of national security and they underpin the resilience of critical infrastructures from power plants to the bank system or online marketplaces for small businesses. Now, we are looking into a world that is much more connected and connected in more complex ways. However, the more devices we connect to the internet, the more vulnerabilities we open up. This means that the number of citizens, organizations and businesses impacted simultaneously by a single attack can be huge. According to several of our studies, cybercrime will cost the world 5.5 trillion euros by the end of 2020, up from 2.7 trillion euros in 2015. The rise is due in part to cybercrime activity during the COVID-19 pandemic. This could be the largest transfer of economic wealth in history. And if it happens, it will be more profitable than the global trade in all major illegal drugs combined. To make it even more seriously, attacks are becoming more complex and more difficult to foresee and prevent. It seems that attackers' capacities and capabilities are even increasing with more computational power distributed across mobile devices and internet-linked appliances. Furthermore, in our imminent future, protection of our citizens will depend on technology even more. Ensuring the privacy of our personal lives, the trust among businesses and in digital services, as well as protection against disinformation and hate speech are just some aspects which we can already see at large scale. This is why the discussion on cybersecurity and digital technologies must be looked at as a societal issue and not only as a purely technological one. Closing the gap, which we discussed today, becomes one of the top priorities for the years to come. And it is certainly a priority for this commission and for me. In order to close the gap, we are currently facing a number of economic and societal challenges. In most industries, market forces generate the necessary incentives for companies to improve their products and services. However, these forces seem inadequate in the cybersecurity domain. Firstly, there is relatively little competition. For instance, the desktop operating system industry is dominated by two companies, while the mobile operating system segment is also characterized by a duopoly, a trend which applies to most digital sectors. This absence of effective competition adversely impacts the incentive for developers to produce secure code. Secondly, in markets with dominant suppliers, users tend to have very little bargaining power. They are not able to exert much pressure on vendors to provide solutions to exposed vulnerabilities resulting either in delayed releases of solutions or poor quality ones. The way we protect openness of our technological systems, the way we encourage connectivity, and the way we protect our values in it will determine how can we position the European Union in the cyber world. Finally, societal challenges are even greater. For example, we all pay attention to our physical ID card and our credit cards. But paradoxically, we often forget to protect our credentials when using digital platforms for online shopping. The misleading assumption that since it is not physical, it is not important, makes an impact not only on the daily use of digital services, but also at a higher level on the definition of strategic industrial decisions. Therefore, it is clear that it is as much a matter of education, culture, politics and policies as of technology. In other words, it is not only about adopting a security by design approach to products and services, but also building a, security, a secure digital society by design. My idea is to tackle these three challenges and develop a secure by design digital European society by working on four complementary angles. 
The first angle is balancing cybersecurity with fundamental rights. This requires a clear legal framework as well as a clear guidance on as to how law should be interpreted and applied. In the case of the European data privacy law, the GDPR, best practices for cybersecurity experts on how to interpret and apply the regulation still needs to develop. We need policymakers, legal experts, researchers, business leaders, and cybersecurity experts to collaborate on ensuring the balance between cybersecurity and fundamental rights. A second angle is the availability of the adequate labor force, skilled people. The job market is currently unable to respond to the growing demand for skilled people in the field of cybersecurity. Today, a visible consequence of this is the 1 million shortfall in employees, which is expected to grow further in the future. A short-term answer to this problem is to encourage existing workers to engage in a continuous education program related to cybersecurity, leading perhaps to a cybersecurity certification. A longer-term solution is to integrate the teaching of cybersecurity skills into school and university curricula. And here I would like really to mention a topic very close to my, to my heart. Please think about more women in cybersecurity. We have only 17%, but we need to use this huge potential and diversity of ideas for us. The third angle is about the industry standards that are needed to be able to hold companies accountable to their customers and the legislators with the necessary flexibility on a case-by-case -case basis. Also, in a hyper-connected world, we need to ensure the interoperability of products and services across all relevant players and across the whole life cycle of the products and services. The fourth and final angle to consider in order to reach a secure digital society by design in Europe is about the need to pay more attention to more efficient transfer of scientific knowledge into commercial products. Belgium excels in cybersecurity research. For instance, the European Aspire project, led by the University of Ghent, developed security solutions for personal mobile devices. This solution has proved to be very useful when people had to go in lockdown and work on their own devices from home offices. Another research group at Leuven leads the European Impact Project that is working on a disruptive solution that should solve multi-party computation issues. The technology aims to guarantee privacy in distributed cloud environments and should end by the end of 2021. As in other technological areas, European Union leads on the research domain, and we need to strengthen the capacity to turn the breakthrough research results into disruptive innovations. We need an innovative and effective mechanism to coordinate research and commercialization activities across programs and across European member states. This will allow us to better monitor and manage the impact of the European Union's investments in strategic technologies, cybersecurity included. And it will also allow us to grow a better portfolio of technologies and companies and to capture the economic potential from emerging technologies. For example, one of the startups we invested in called Crypto Quantum, Crypto Quantic, is using quantum technology to create end-to-end -end security solutions which will be necessary for managing billions of devices in the Internet of Things. This cybersecurity product is developed using the research results that we were previously funded by Horizon 2020. Now, if we manage to turn Europe into a secure by design society, I'm convinced we'll get there. We'll be able to take full advantage of the economical opportunities that cybersecurity offers. For instance, Belgian companies in the cybersecurity field employ 16,000 people. Global market for cybersecurity products and services has been growing between 15 and 20% annually. However, overall, 
only 14% of the top 500 global security providers are headquartered in Europe. We have to work to change the current situation. And the good news is that we have also the right instruments to change it. To start with, and why not to consider the establishment of a European platform for vulnerability management, coordinating and encouraging the efforts of the whole cybersecurity community. The establishment of a common culture of collaboration might also encourage firms to disclose cybersecurity breaches, what will turn into faster and more efficient development of state-of-the-art secure products and services. In addition to this, Europe, European Platform for Coordination, the proposed Horizon Europe program contains a full spread of tools and funding opportunities for cybersecurity. Horizon Europe is the continuation of our Horizon 2020 program that funded cybersecurity projects with over 500 million euro, out of which more than 20 million were allocated to organizations based in Belgium. Within Horizon Europe program and in the context of this conference, I want to highlight the opportunity that the fully fledged European Innovation Council will offer and can offer to close the gap between researchers and practitioners by offering a full set of tools to support cybersecurity researchers and innovators in their process to scale up. The Pathfinder mechanism supports researchers on their breakthrough innovations, also in the area of cybersecurity, while the accelerator will provide a decisive push for the best entrepreneurs and innovators to scale up their ideas with grants and equity for up to 12.5 million euros. I will be very glad to see, to see more projects with, within our European Innovation Council. Now, this brings me to my final point. We should not be afraid of innovative concepts, even in the most traditional sectors. And in this conference, you will be talking about cyber diplomacy. The Commission has worked with the European Member States to develop the Cyber Diplomacy Toolbox, which we adopted in May 2019. You know that this framework consists of measures to prevent and deal with cyber attacks from external actors against the EU. It includes a sanction regime against individuals and entities. And I think that it's time really to see how we can operationalize, how we can really put forward this idea. Because we all know that we need to take into consideration a lot of aspects, a lot of very complex issues when we talk about this, this topic. So now I believe that you will touch upon many of these topics in the sessions during the conference. I'm always looking forward to learn about new developments in the area of cybersecurity from events like this one. Your work during the conference will provide insights to help the development of a secure by design European society while reaping the economic benefits of the sector and talking, talk, taking always into account the European values and rights. So thank you very much. And I would like to wish you a very, very fruitful discussions today. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Commissioner Gabriel. That was an excellent opening. You have been very kind uh, because not only have you spoken about how we need to think uh, about key issues to close the gap, but also you have indicated that we are in a way at a fork in the road and really the decisions that we make today will be necessary if we want to arrive at a destination where in Europe or in many other parts also we have security by design. And you uh, share those four points and indeed it is things that will require time, effort and energy, but if we can get there, certainly we'll choose that path. So thank you very much again. And uh, we all look forward to these discussions and uh, with this now, I see that uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, Philippe Coffin, is uh, online. He's also the Minister for uh, Defense. So, um, but I guess you can have both hats on when you're speaking on, on this particular issue. So uh, with no further ado, I also would like to uh, give you the floor uh, so that you can share some of your thoughts when we're speaking about uh, cyber, digital, and technology and how these things link together as we try to close the gaps. So the floor is yours. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Commissioner Gabriel, dear colleagues and experts from uh, around the globe. Thank you for this compliment about uh, cyber in Belgium. Uh, it's my great pleasure to open this global online event on cyber, digital and tech. An event that promises to be a unique experience. I would like to thank and congratulate the EU Cyber Direct Programme for the outset for building such an impressive programme despite the current difficult condition. The punchline of this conference is closing the gap a perfect call for action to deal with the situation we all face today. On the one hand, it is easy to see this gap around and among us in the real world as well as in cyberspace. Divisions are growing in our societies and the role technology plays in this uh, ambivalent. Well aware of the many benefits it can offer, today's uh, thinkers and experts focus on the negative effects technology can have. The deepening of the digital divide between poor and rich, uh, between north and south, the echo chambers uh, it can create, the race between countries for new weapons among countries, the unseen possibilities to undermine universal human rights and freedoms. These challenges are indeed real and they deserve uh, our full attention. The different panels, uh, roundtables, and workshops during the coming days will focus on them, looking through the specific angles, angles of the knowledge, freedom, actors, accountability, gender, and geography. But this conference is mainly about focusing on the ways to close these gaps, to state it simply and a bit naively, how can we build a better world? Technology may shape our future, but we have control on how this will happen. It is first about developing ourselves taking responsibility and making sure others can to do it for themselves. Building resilient societies is crucial when so many things are in constant evolution. It is on the other hand also about building bridges with our allies and partners, but certainly as well with our enemies and rivals. It is now an opportune time for politics and diplomacy. However, politicians and diplomats cannot and should not do it on their own. Your views and the one of all parties should be heard and taken seriously. This is the reason why Belgium was so supportive of this idea of the conference. The current COVID-19 crisis has stopped us from meeting each other in the beautiful Lemon Palace here in Brussels, but going online, reaching a vast and diverse group of participants and an example of the kind of resilience and outreach we precisely need. I wish you an enriching and challenging conference and hope to continue our future dialogue in Brussels or cyberspace. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Minister Goffin, and also indeed for the support of Belgium as we uh, went ahead with the conference. As you said, it was going to be in a very nice location, but now we have an opportunity maybe to engage uh, more colleagues in different parts of the world. And thank you also for uh, you know, again, reminding us that we have a lot of positive, positive opportunities coming from this technology for a long time, and that we're we need to balance that, of course, with the challenges and the drawbacks. And it was stunning to hear Commissioner Gabriel's reference to that 5.5 trillion estimate for the cost of cybercrime for this year, which is really a doubling, uh, given the figure that she provided for 2015. Those are massive figures. But of course, there are lots of benefits, uh, big benefits for the GDP. So we need to make sure that we can boost those. And so thank you for, for reminding us again that this is an issue really about trying to get, to get the better out of this. And with that, I'm very happy now to uh, pass on the floor uh, to Patrick uh, Pavlak, my colleague from the USS, uh, who is actually sitting in Brussels. And uh, I know that he has a few uh, kind of uh, housekeeping uh, elements to, to remind us of, uh, you know, before we go on on this long, quite long journey of different uh, roundtables and uh, workshops and keynote speeches. But again, I want to thank both of our keynote speakers for their interventions uh, this morning. Very much appreciated. And again, we will uh, keep the conversation open. And of course, there were lots of recommendations given. So definitely a lot of work to look forward to. But with this, Patrick, uh, over to you. And uh, we look forward to also now the, the first session that will be coming very soon. Over to you, Patrick. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Gustav, and thank you, Madam Commissioner and Mr. Goffin, for joining us this morning and sharing with us your views. Um, as uh, Gustav already mentioned, over the next five days, we will engage with over 250 participants from all over the world, and this is only for panel sessions. So these are the participants who have registered. We're hoping, of course, that this number is going to be much bigger for the sessions that are publicly uh, streamed live, like the roundtables and uh, the keynote speeches. Now, as you all know, uh, we have a pretty packed program over the next five days. And our plan, of course, was to have everybody here in Brussels. I must say that even the weather is co cooperating today, it's a beautiful sunny day, but unfortunately, uh, we will not be able to enjoy it together. Nonetheless, uh, over the next five days, as you know, we have uh, the packed program. We have roundtables, keynotes, uh, workshops, and panels. And even though we cannot be here physically, we would really like to encourage you to make the best use uh, of this time together. The whole point behind closing the gaps was really to bring different communities together, bring different regions uh, together, but also different disciplines. So as you engage with your peers around the world over the next five days, please keep that in mind uh, and exchange those ideas. Uh, we will also make the list of participants available afterwards uh, and that will be available on our website so hopefully that will also help you navigate uh, the next five days now um i will not be very long and i think i'll just finish here with uh, the reminder that those of you who are of course on social media please feel free to tweet uh, uh, from the sessions and the events all of them are um, uh, to be shared uh, and also, finally, please do not forget to join us today at uh, 1 p.m. for the first of the roundtables that will be devoted to uh, closing the knowledge gap. Uh, we will have several of those right tables over, over the next five days, uh, including workshops. Uh, so please make sure to follow the agenda also on our website and join in for the um, for those parts of the program that uh, interests you most. And with that, I would like to thank you, Gustav, for joining us. Uh, again, also another big thanks to all our partners who worked with us uh, on this specific initiative. And there are too many of them to list uh, all of them here. I would maybe like to uh, single out the Egmont uh, Institute and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, who have, oh, sorry, of Belgium, who have supported us uh, with this initiative. Uh, and of course, um, colleagues working uh, behind the scenes who will be facilitating those meetings over the next uh, five days. So with this, I thank you very much for participating in this first keynote and look forward to our discussions and debates over the next five days. Thank you. <laughs>